all on all of our webinars that we've put on. If you find this to be useful to you, please consider joining NOFA Mass as a member or making a small donation to support our staff to continue to do this work. Any amount helps. Go to our website, NOFA, at, uh, go to nofamass.org to get more information on how you can donate and you get a chance to see all of our other programming. This evening, we are joined by Russ Cohen. He is the author of Wild Plants I Have Known and Eaten. Uh, very excited to hear about Russ. I had a chance uh, to talk to him a little bit about some of the things that he's done and to see some of his presentation ahead of time, so I'm pretty excited. The format for tonight will be a talk with a Q&A question and answer afterwards. Now you can submit those questions using uh, the question feature. You, some of you have already used that to let us know where you're coming from, or you can use the chat. Or if you're dialing in, if you're calling us uh, via phone, you can text your question to 413-214-1237. So I am not uh, going to take any more time. I am very excited to hear from Russ, and Russ is on the line with us right now. So at this point, are you ready, Russ? I'm ready. Okay. So at this so, point, I turn everything over to Russ. And if you're having any technical issues, feel free to use the question feature as well, and I can work with you behind the scenes. Russ, you have it. All right, excellent. So thank you, Anna. And hi, everybody. Uh, it's quite uh, awesome to see so many of you signed up to um, take part in this webinar today. Um, so as you may know, uh, I typically do about three dozen, sometimes more, in-person wild edibles walks and talks throughout New England and Eastern New York State in a typical year. And of course, <laughs> goes without saying, this is not a typical year. So here we are online and we're going to have a little virtual foraging trip. But hopefully uh, this information here will uh, be useful to you in the weeks to come as we uh, get outside and venture forth and uh, see how to connect to the outdoors through our taste buds, which is um, something I love to do and I love to share my enthusiasm about that uh, with a live audience. And so uh, here I am online uh, without the benefit of getting immediate feedback from live audience, but I will make do with that. So uh, before I plunge into the show, I just wanted to cover a few general ground rules about foraging just to um, I'll make sure uh, we're grounded there, and then we'll start talking about specific plants. And my uh, slides are organized in chronicle or order by foraging opportunities. So you'll see at the beginning of the show, we start with stuff that's available right now, and then we go through the season and then uh, end in the fall. But anyway, before we get to that, so question number one that I'm sure is on the mind of many of you uh, especially some of you novice uh, erstwhile foragers out there, is just how risky is it to put a wild plant in your mouth? Could you get sick? Could you even die? And I'm happy to tell you that at least for this region, the Northeast uh, US, um, the risk of getting very sick or dying from a wild plant that you eat is relatively low if you remember a couple of rules. One thing is that um, and uh, there are some important exceptions to this, like uh, a po uh, apparently poison hemlock and water hemlock, the roots of those two plants are very poisonous and apparently they don't taste bad enough to tip uh, an eater off into a problem. So uh, those are in the carrot family and the carrot family is one that I tread lightly in because of the presence of those uh, very seriously poisonous plants. But in general, the vast majority of poisonous plants that grow in our region taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. Now that doesn't mean that every edible wild plant is going to be delicious straight from the bush or the vine or whatever. A lot of them require some kind of advanced preparation. But let's say uh, you're out and about, you see a plant you think you learned from this show, you read about from a book or, or something, and you pick it and you bring it home and you prepare it according to the instructions and you take a bite and it doesn't taste good, you might not want to override that danger signal your taste buds might be giving you. You might have made a mistake in identification. So do uh, think of your taste buds as a backup identification tool. And I should also add that I did not learn what I know, which I've been doing for over four decades from just walking down the trail, popping stuff in my mouth and see what happens. 
I benefited from reading books and, and learning that way. And I benefited from the accumulated knowledge that humanity has had going back eons to Native Americans and before uh, just from people finding out what was edible. And so I benefit from that accumulated knowledge and I don't do a lot of experimentation. But there are some cases where giving a quick nibble to a plant uh, confirms whether or not you have the right thing or not. And and for most of the plants I'm talking about here, even those that could possibly make you sick, um, and I should add on the plants that are poisonous, the, uh, for most of these things, um, your body is natural defense mechanisms and you'd poop it out or puke it out before you get into any serious trouble. But, but even so, Purposes Talk has talked to you about the safe, really yummy edible weeds out there. And we'll get to those in just a second, but just to finish on this thought. So uh, if let's say you see something, you're pretty damn sure it's edible and a very quick taste is gonna confirm you got the right thing or not. So you put it just in the front of your mouth with a lot of saliva and you give it a very quick taste and you spit it right out. Even if that plant were poisonous, the worst that's gonna happen is that you feel uh, nauseous for a little while. And that's probably because you scared yourself to death more than anything. So. Uh, uh, I don't make a practice of that, but it isn't an inherently risky activity if you're already pretty sure you've got the right thing. Okay, now having said all that, allergies. It is possible that you could be allergic to an edible wild plant uh, and simply not know about it just because you've never been exposed to that particular species before. Uh, so the standard advice is to not eat a huge amount of some new food you're trying for the first time just to make sure that you're not gonna break all out in hives or anything. But if generally you're not allergic to conventional vegetables, it's pretty unlikely you're gonna be allergic to wild vegetables because chemically they're very similar. All right, now I'm not going to talk about mushrooms tonight. I just don't have time in this hour long format to do that. But I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, the risk of eating a wild mushroom because it's very different from plants. We have a number of wild mushroom species out there that are potentially lethal. And unfortunately, there's nothing from the flavor whatsoever that gives you any advanced indication that there's anything to worry about. So the risk of picking the wrong kind of mushroom and eating it and getting very sick or possibly even dying is much greater than for plants. Having said that, you can arrange all the mushroom species that are on a line and cluster to one end of those species that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous versus those that at the other end that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out as you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. Uh, and so in some of my talks, especially the in-person talks where we're walking around, if we encounter edible mushrooms, I happily talk about them too. And we'll just have to leave those for another presentation. But I just wanted to underscore the fact that the picking and eating wild mushrooms is, is materially much more risky than uh, with wild plants. All right, a couple other general issues. Um, where do you go and pick stuff? Well, first of all, let me tell you where I don't go to pick stuff. I don't pick along heavily traveled roadways. I don't pick along trails where everybody takes their dog for a walk. Although if something is growing above a certain height, even a Great Dane can't reach it. So I don't really worry about that. Um, there's no magic formula about this. Just use your common sense. So if you're hiking in the woods and you see a nice berry patch and you see a bunch of building debris dumped right next to the berry patch, probably not a good idea to pick from that berry patch. If the plants themselves don't look healthy, they're stunted or wilted or spotted, or there's just something off about them, it's possible that they're picking up some contaminants in the soil that you don't want to expose yourself to, or it's possible they were sprayed with herbicides, which can happen sometimes in some of the invasive species I'm gonna talk about in this show. And so uh, if you see that, just walk on by and, and don't pick from that spot and wait for a cleaner spot. And uh, so uh, where do you go and pick stuff? Well, uh, so I'm avoiding the heavily traveled areas. I'm going to the more out of the way shaggier areas where it's less likely that uh, there's you know, pollution coming from cars or businesses or other obvious sources of pollution or, or the dogs and things like that. And uh, those are good places. And I just wanna talk about one specific, well, in a generic way, but a specific type of uh, place that I like to go foraging and that is organic farms. But I wanna say in the same breath that uh, as many edible weeds and invasive species that I'm gonna talk about on this show that are out there, and there's a lot of them out there, it, they're not enough to make a significant dent in our food supply. So we really need to be growing our food and organic is a great way to do it. And so I hope that uh, 
you will be supporting your local organic farmers, patronizing the farm stand, getting a CSA share if that'll work for you, because uh, it's really important to financially support these. And of course, the umbrella organization, the NOFA groups like NOFA Mass, uh, if we're gonna have a strong organic farm economy. But having said all that, organic play farms are great places to forage. Well, why is that? Well, reason number one is the obvious one. They're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that the way that organic farms manage weeds is they're not weeding every square inch of the farm every single day. They weed strategically. And so there are usually areas in organic farms where they just let the weeds go. Let's say, you know, for example, um, after the peas come out in the early summer, uh, unless they put another crop in there, they're not going to bother to weed where the peas were. And so the weeds will rush right in there. Several weeks later, there are healthy crops of weeds in there. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> if you time your visit right to an organic farm, I'm just going to get get a drink, excuse me. <clears throat> you can find huge amounts of weeds, enough to feed whole armies. So if I've got a big dinner party plan, <laughs> and once again, when we can have big dinner parties again, and I need lots of raw material, I'll go to an organic farm and, and get all I need that way. And the third reason is the edges of, oh, the fourth reason, I'm sorry, the third reason is that the wonderful living soil that makes the organically grown crops so nutritious to eat, all the good stuff is getting into the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are gonna be um, very tasty and healthy for you, a lot better than let's say weed growing in a crack in a sidewalk. And then the fourth reason to go foraging at organic farms is that edges of organic farms often have great edge species like fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, stuff like that. So my advice is, form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds, you want the weeds, so potentially it's this great partnership. Now, having said all that, you can't just go and start picking weeds at an organic farm. It's important to talk to the farm managers of the staff first there, make sure it's okay with them. And I realize in this time is social distancing, it's a little bit more challenging to do that, but I understand that a lot of organic farms have uh, established online communications with all their uh, members and with their patrons and stuff like that. So uh, my advice would be write them and, and check in with them and make sure it's okay if you pick weeds there. And my guess is that they'll be fine with it. I get invited to do a lot of wild edibles walks at organic farms. So I think they understand the synergy there. All right, so uh, now I'm gonna get into my show. Let's see if I can click on it and pull up a slide. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, now out there among things to forge on, there's really sort of three categories and, and one is sort of a, a, a two or subcategories of a second category. So it's native plants and non-native plants and the non-native plants fit into two categories, weeds and invasive species. So weed would be an ex example of a weed would be like a dandelion or a chicory or a burdock or chickweed. I'll get into those in my show later. And then these invasive species like Japanese knotweed and uh, autumn olive and dame's rocket. And I'll get into those in the show later. And then there are native species. So um, native plants, and we have a lot of wonderful edible native plants, and I will talk about some of them in the show here. Uh, but native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food or some other important portion of their life cycle. So I encourage folks, if you're going to forage for native species, to use some forbearance and restraint to make sure that you don't upset the ecological balance in any way. So, um, uh, so please uh, do that, if you will. Um, and I'll just point out though, that depending upon the part of the plant you're harvesting, there are gonna be different impacts. For example, berry picking and nut gathering, along with mushroom hunting, those are relatively benign foraging activities because all you're doing is gathering the seed or the spore dispersal portion of the organism. And there's often a lot of those around us. So if you're gathering some, it's usually not that big deal at all. And acorns is a great example of that. There are plenty of acorns around. So, uh, but uh, having said that, so if you're actually digging plants up to harvest them or stripping all the leaves or all the flowers off plants to harvest them, you can imagine that would be a lot more traumatic for the plant. So do keep that in mind. All right, so yes, uh, invasive species. Usually when people hear about invasive species, you're hearing about the bad ecological news. So here's a guy that came out in Massachusetts, but uh, if you're from another state, uh, I'm pretty confident to say that your state will have a similar guide to this one in Massachusetts. So this is uh, 
uh, intended to educate people about the adverse ecological impacts of invasive species, of which there are many. So this book covers 66 of what are considered to be the most ecologically disruptive non-native uh, plants that it could grow in Massachusetts. All right, so the plants in this book are bad news, but if there is a silver lining to the invasive cloud, uh, perhaps it's this, that out of the 66 species, at least 20 of them of the 66 are edible. And as far as at least most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. I am totally serious about this. This is guilt-free foraging, as well as the very common weeds I'm going to talk about in this show. So you can relax about it and, um, and don't worry about uh, uh, adverse ecological impacts. So here's a list of some of the invasive species that I consider to be really yummy. We're gonna talk about most of these in the show today. All right, so uh, I can't ask an audience if you're ready to go on, but here we go. So here's the first plant I'm gonna talk about. This one's in season right now. This is stinging nettle, a plant that you could recognize in the dark, a plant that you could recognize even if you're blind because it does sting. And so those of you that have never been stung by stinging nettle, you should know that unlike poison ivy, where you don't find out that you got into it until a day or two later, if you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. Uh, but the good news is that the sting rarely lasts more for an, than an hour, and there is an antidote to the sting in stinging nettle, and I'm going to talk about that later in the show. So this is a plant that's in season right now, and this is the uh, ideal stage to get it. When it's still a diminutive plant, like uh, six to eight inches tall, is a great time to get it. And what I do, so I'm going to use my cursor here to show you, is I will just harvest the top cluster of leaves off of every nettle shoot and just pick that. I know how to do this with my bare hands without getting stung, but if you're a novice, you could use scissors or some gloves and harvest them that way. So you take the top part like that or like that, and you just gather up a bunch of them. And often nettles grow in good sized patches, so you can gather quite a few at one time. And then you bring them home and you uh, throw them in a, um, a bowl of water to wash them off. And then I will take some tongs, so I'm still not touching them, and I take some tongs and I uh, fling them into the cooking pot and I more or less steam the nettle tops and the water that's still clinging to them from the washing process and you sting, steam them for about five or six minutes and they will shrink a lot like that but after you steam them the stinging the the steaming process completely disarms the plant in fact it converts the chemical that caused the sting into a protein so stinging nettle is about seven percent protein which is very high for a leafy green vegetable. And plus, stinging nettle has all kinds of other vitamins and minerals in it, like calcium. So it's the closest thing I know of to a vitamin pill in the plant world. It's very nutritious for you. And, um, and although a lot of people say that steamed nettle greens taste like spinach, and you can use steamed nettle greens just like cooked spinach, I think the flavor is a little bit more like split peas. So uh, one of the things you can do from uh, after you've steamed the nettle greens is you can make cream of stinging nettle soup. So this recipe is in my book and we'll get to my book at the end of the show. Uh, so that's a very easy thing to make. It's just a pureed soup with a sauteed potatoes and onions and the steamed nettle greens and you throw it all in the blender with a, with a half and half and chicken stock if you're not a vegetarian uh, or a, a vegetarian stock instead and that's it. And then here's stinging nettle balls, and this is a very retro recipe from the 1950s, uh, kind of like a good housekeeping recipe uh, called spinach balls, where uh, the easy shortcut is to use Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together, and you just substitute the stinging nettle greens for the uh, spinach in that recipe, and it comes out great. It's a great appetizer. All right, so here's a plant that looks a lot like stinging nettle, and those of you astute observers of plants will know that, yes, this is a member of the mint family. You can tell that because you see the square stems and the opposite leaves, and I'm happy to tell you there are no poisonous members of the mint family that grow in the northeast U.S. They don't all taste good, but there aren't any that would make you sick. So this is one that is used both as a culinary uh, plant as a medicinal plant. It's catnip. And catnip is not a native species, but it does occasionally escape from cultivation. I saw it just the other day outside of Boston where I live, growing next to some stinging nettles, appropriately enough. Now, catnip has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative. It's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves fresh or dried either way. 
All right, here's curl to curly dock. This is the antidote to the stinging, stinging nettle. So if you get stung by a stinging nettle, you just take a bunch of young dock leaves and, and uh, scrunch out them out, get some juice out, and then apply that juice to the st where you got stung with the stinging nettle will help make the, make the sting go away. So this is a plant that's also equally edible in its own right. So this is what it looks like in the spring, and you just gather some of the younger leaves just enrolling in the center of the plant. And what I would do with those is blanch them, drop them into boiling water for just 20 seconds, and that will take away any tinge of bitterness they have. And then you use the cooked dock greens in recipes. So for example, you can make a cream of dock soup, which is very similar to the cream of singing nettle soup. Also, one recipe that's in my book that I didn't mention in the show here is spanakopita, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese. So you can use either the steamed nettle greens or the steamed dock greens in that recipe, and either way it comes out great. And, the, and so the two medicinal uses for dock, I mentioned the one is the antidote to sting and stinging nettle, and the other one is the root, the dock root. It's a very large yellow root, and it isn't really edible. It's used medicinally. In fact, the medicinal name by herbalists of this plant is yellow dock. And the root has several medicinal uses, but the one I'm most familiar with is that it helps the body assimilate iron better. And so pregnant women, anemic people, will take it for that purpose to boost their iron levels. And I think the major way that's prepared is uh, with a tincture. All right, so this plant is a notorious plant hated by ecologists, grows all over the world. Uh, it's not a native species. It's at or near the top of the invasive species list. Probably many of you in the audience could recognize it just from the photos, but in case you can't, here's what it is, Japanese knotweed. And this is a plant that's really yummy. It has a uh, medicinal use too that I don't really have time to get into now, but I'll just tell you, uh, I harvest a lot of this every spring and this will be available in the Boston area very, very soon. So for some of you, it's already at this stage and others of you, it'll be at this stage soon. So the first stage is what I call the wild asparagus stage when these shoots come up and you'll find them, you see, so that's what it looks like uh, in, the, in the late summer when it's blooming. And this is what you wanna look for now is a bunch of these old dried bamboo-like stalks from the previous year's growth. In the middle of all that, you're gonna see shoots like this. So when these shoots are about a foot tall, I call that the wild asparagus stage. And you could just snap off the shoot at ground level, steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to harvest this plant is what I call the wild rhubarb stage, when the shoots are about a foot and a half to two feet tall, and they look like this in the left side of the photo, I'll just get out my jackknife and cut them at ground level and lop off the top cluster leaves. And then I'll have a stalk that looks like that. And next what I'll do is peel the very outer layer of the stalk off because it's stringy. There's nothing poisonous about it, but you wanna get that outer layer off just to make sure that it doesn't get caught in your teeth later when you use these in baking, which is a, what I usually do. But after you peel the knotweed shoot, it looks like this uh, on the left and it's perfectly edible uh, just as it is. It tastes, it's tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple, or you can chop it up like I've done in the bowl here and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here is my strawberry knotweed pie. The recipe's in my book. I love to make this. I love to serve it to people. Um, and most people that I serve it to say, hey, I like this even more than strawberry rhubarb pie. And, um, and it is yummy. Now you might be looking at this recipe and say, okay, uh, I understand, but I'm a little intimidated by pie crust and that's a lattice work top. I don't know if I can pull it off. So I'm gonna show you a way to use the peel chopped up knotweed shoots that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. And that is you can use those little uh, cut up uh, knotweed pieces as little edible tart containers. And you can fill them uh, with a flavored cream cheese or salmon mousse or something like that. And there's this really yummy instant appetizer that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. So that is Japanese knotweed. So the seasons for that is uh, mid-April to early May, and then that's it. Um, you know, it's not really worth eating the rest of the season, and you just have to wait for that time to come around again in the calendar to uh, harvest it and enjoy it. All right, so here's garlic mustard. This plant vies with Japanese knotweed to be among the most hated invasive species out there. I'll be honest with you, I don't um, relish eating this one quite as much as the knotweed, but it is edible. It's out there right now it, it, in the Boston area. It's before this stage, before it blooms, and that's actually what I consider to be the tastiest stage. The whole plant is very pungent, and it has a strong flavor. Um, 
uh, a bitterness to it, which an herbalist would say eating bitter plants is good for you because it stimulates your liver and that's a good thing we all should be doing. So people have various tolerances for bitter. I find this stage of the plant, although it's still edible at this stage, too bitter to my taste. What I do is I harvest it at an earlier stage. This is pretty much the stage the plant's in now, the Boston area. And it's these tender shoots right here when they're nice and soft and supple that I consider to be the most palatable part of the plant. And so you can just yank the whole plant up as an invasive species. So what you wanna do is yank the whole plant up, strip out this tender stalk, save that part, that's yummy, and take the rest of the plant and put it in a black plastic garbage bag and then set it out with your trash. Do not put uh, garlic mustard plants in your compost because there's too much of a chance they'll survive the composting process and then you'd actually be helping to proliferate this plant. So that would not be a good idea. Whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to push that button. Let's go here and do this button. All right, so this plant is wintercress. This is a cousin of the garlic mustard. It's at this stage right now in the Boston area. Although it's er edible at an earlier stage, this is the wild broccoli stage. So you see right here, these florets on the plant. So that's a fun part of the plant to use. So you pick those off and you do have to boil these for several minutes because uh, once again of the strong bitter flavor. But then after you do that, the flavor is identical to broccoli rob. So uh, this is a really common farm weed at organic farms. So it's a good one to look for uh, soon. And uh, so uh, I encourage you to do that. Oh, I pushed the wrong button again. Sorry, I will stop doing that. Okay. So uh, in my show, I don't put up the name of this plant because I ask people in the audience what it is. And uh, frequently people will own, er erroneously chime in and say, oh, that's phlox. It is not phlox. It's actually a species called Dame's Rocket. And it is another wild, another member, another wild edible member of the mustard family. And the way you can tell it easily apart from phlox is that all phlox family flowers have five petals. These have four petals, as do just about all members of the mustard family. So uh, yeah, so this is Dame's Rocket, another invasive species, so another guilt-free foraging opportunity. And you see how it comes in white flowers and a purpley flower. And that is invariably how you see it in the wild, the two colors together growing in the same patch. And so, um, and it really doesn't matter um, which color that you eat because they're um, equally yummy. I tend to pick the purpley flowers and eat them because purple is a funner color than white. So there are audible, other edible parts to the plant, but I uh, love to eat the flowers in these plants because they're really good. They have a kind of a sweet garlicky radishy flavor. So as I said, yeah, I tend to just use the purple colored uh, Dame's Rocket flowers because the funner color than white. And these you could eat just plain, you could, uh, add to a salad or you could um, you know put as a uh, garnish on a plate and um, and they're very nice. Okay so I'm calling you from eastern Massachusetts and we don't have any large snow-capped mountains like you see in the distance there. That photo is actually Mount Washington in the presidential range and I took this photo uh, over Memorial Day weekend when the dandelions are blooming up in northern New Hampshire but for most of us the dandelions are are getting close to this stage now, they're still mostly not blooming and that's actually the right stage to harvest them, to eat them. So I think that dandelions are responsible for turning more people off of wild plants, eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes something like this. It's the spring and you look out in your backyard and you see all these blooming dandelion plants and you say to yourself, I heard dandelion is edible, I should try them. So you bring a few, you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite, it's incredibly bitter, you spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never gonna eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So in my opinion, when you start to see whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, it's really too late to be eating dandelions. You wanna get them before they bloom and actually the best stage to eat, eat them is when they look like this. And the best part of the dandelion, in my opinion, flavor-wise, are the unopened flowers, the dandelion buds. So you see them here in this photo. And so um, each dandelion bud is relatively small. They're only about a quarter inch in diameter, but uh, at the organic farms where I've encouraged you to go foraging, there's often lots of dandelion plants on the margins of the farm where the plants get nice and big. And I found, found plants in the edges of, um, 
organic farms where I found over 200 dandelion buds per plant. So if you're finding plants like that, yeah, it takes a little while to pick them off, but you'll eventually gather all you need to feed yourself, your family, uh, whoever you're, you're uh, serving food to. So how do you prepare these? Very simple. So you pick the dandelion buds and you bring them home, wash them off in the bowl of water, get a pot of water boiling in the stove, throw the dandelion buds in and cook them for 60 seconds. That's it. That's all they need. And at that point, you can add them to soups or omelets or casseroles. But um, uh, before you do anything with them, before you even add any salt or butter to them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. They have like a flavor that's like a cross between spinach, artichokes, uh, Brussels sprouts, and corn. If you can imagine all those flavors together. So they're among my fav favorite vegetables, period, cultivated or wild. So uh, I heartily recommend them. Now, those of you in the audience might be saying, well, what about dandelion leaves? Aren't those edible too? And yes, they are. And I uh, will harvest them at the same time. So when I'm picking the buds off dandelions, if I see some nice uh, green tender dandelion leaves on the plant, I'll harvest them too and prepare them the same way. Okay, so uh, I did mention bitterness before and dandelions are a very, very healthy plant to eat. So herbalists are very um, uh, um, uh, supportive of eating dandelions. It's eating your medicine because uh, it's a liver tonic and uh, it's just very good for you and they taste good. So how good is that? And just about everybody's got dandelions uh, in their backyard, so they should be immediately available to you. Okay, there I did. I pushed the wrong button again. Sorry about that. Here we go. So chicory is related to dandelions. This photo is out of sequence because it's um, uh, a midsummer photo, but um, I wanted to show you what the flowers look like. Dandelions and chicory are pretty synonymous. You can pretty much eat the same parts and they have a similar look to them. And so if you picked one mistake from the other, there's absolutely no harm done because you can eat them the same way. So let's talk about chicory flowers since I've got them on the photo here. So chicory flowers are edible. They have almost no flavor. So why use them? Because blue is an unusual food color. So it's fun to just snip the petals off and add them to a salad. Chicory leaves are edible like dandelion leaves in the spring or in the fall. They're mild. In the summer, they're way too bitter to use. But probably the most uh, well-known edible part of the chicory is the root, and it's actually used to make a coffee substitute or additive. This is all explained in my book, but basically you want to ro roast the roots slowly in an oven until they're brittle and aromatic, and then throw them into a food processor and grind them up and then make uh, uh, a beverage from those grounds. And I find that I only need about half the amount of chicory grounds to make the same strength beverage as coffee grounds. And whatever device you use to make coffee, like a Mr. Coffee Maker or a plunger, whatever, you can use the same exact device to make the chicory drink. And the chicory drink tastes remarkably like coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory the same way. Flavor is very similar. The one big difference is that chicory does not have caffeine in it. So for those of you out in the audience that say, well, what's the point of drinking it if there's no caffeine in it, then the chicory drink's just not gonna cut it for you. All right, so here's chickweed, and this is in season right now, and it will be again in the fall. So um, this has a very mild flavor. <clears throat> You can cook with it, but it shrinks quite a bit. So I tend to just use it raw. And you could use it as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or a lettuce substitute in a salad. So uh, that's a great one. Very common weed at organic farms. Here are violets. These aren't quite out yet. These are out after the dandelion blooms have been blooming a little while. Violet leaves are edible, uh, raw or cooked. Uh, until the flowers go by. After the flowers go by, I think the leaves aren't quite as good, but while the flowers are out or before the flowers out, the leaves are good. And violet leaves by weight are higher in vitamin A than carrots and higher in vitamin C than oranges. So a lot of vitamins there. And the violet flowers are edible too. And you can um, put them right into a salad just like that, or you can candy them and use them as decoration for, let's say, this uh, black walnut cake. I'll talk about black walnuts later. So daisies are edible, uh, but the best part of a daisy are the leaves before the flowers come out. So by the time you see patches of daisies like this, they're not gonna be as tasty as they are before they bloom. So what do they look like before they bloom? They look like this, and I apologize, this slide is a little out of focus, but if you look at this daisy bud right here, you see it's got a flat top to it, and you see some markings on it, like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. 
So look for that and then look for leaves like this. And that's the right stage to harvest daisies. And um, daisies can be so daisy leaves can be so tasty as a raw vegetable. I've never bothered to cook them. I just put them straight into my salad. They're really excellent. All right, so here's lamb's quarters, really, really common weed at organic farms. And um, this photo was taken in early June, but you often find lamb's quarters at this ideal stage for harvesting throughout the growing season because this is very opportunistic weed. So uh, if uh, they stop weeding at an organic farm, the lamb's quarters, if it's there, will germinate quite quickly and we'll uh, grow to this stage in uh, about a month. So um, that'd be great. Now you'll see some whitish dust in the center of each plant here. That's not from the roadside or anything. That's a natural mealy dust the plant produces on its own. It's one of the ways to help identify this plant. So one of the uh, other nicknames of this plant is wild spinach, which is correct. This is a wild cousin of spinach. You can use it exactly like spinach. So you can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked. You do not have to boil this one because it's very mild. So you can just steam it. This is also really great um, raw material for the spanakop that I mentioned before, and you do not need to cook the lamb's quarters before you use it in that uh, recipe. So uh, that's a great one to know. Here is sheep sorrel. This one you see in places that have acidic soil. So those of you that have called in from places or uh, down uh, on the webinar from places where the soil is not acidic, you might not run into this one very much. For, but for those of us with acidic soil, it's a very common non-native species. This one's from Europe, but it's a diminutive cousin of the French garden sorrel. So you can use it the exact same way. So you can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it. Now here is a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor. It's just a botanical coincidence. This one's called wood sorrel or sour grass. It's in the genus Oxalis, so it's related to star fruit and the houseplant Oxalis. And, um, and the leaves on this one are edible. Uh, you notice that they have heart-shaped uh, leaflets. This is how to tell it apart from clover. Clover leaflets are much more oval shaped. Now while clover is technically edible, the leaves, you really need to have multiple stomachs to digest it properly. So I don't usually teach that one to people. And this one, uh, uh, humans can eat the leaves or the flowers or these little guys right here, these um, seed pods are um, juicy and succulent and sour and you can eat them too. Now the sour, the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in the sheep sorrel and in the wood sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid which is not good to eat in huge amounts, like an enormous salad bowl full of just this plant or a combination of two plants. If you ate that much, that could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium or it could irritate your stomach lining. But there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So it's perfectly safe to eat in moderation with other things. Here is peppergrass and poor man's pepper, two related plants that look very much alike. Uh, it's very easy to confuse them. There is no downside confusing them because they're edible the exact same way. It's these seed pods right here that are edible on the peppergrass and on the poor man's peppers. So, and they have a sharp peppery flavor like watercress, which is a cousin of this plant. And this one, the one on the left, has a really long season of availability. You can find it at this stage from mid-spring until December. And so it's a great one to remember to uh, uh, harvest. And so um, uh, I encourage you to look for that. And here's an example of where I was out on somebody else's natural history program and they were serving us lunch and they were making these roast beef and boursin sandwiches and the peppergrass was growing outside the building where the sandwiches are being assembled. And so I said to the leader, how about adding this peppergrass to the sandwiches? And she said, sure. So it was a great way uh, to use the plant. Okay, um, I, uh, I give anybody in the audience that could recognize this species of plant in the photo, just from this photo, I'll give you a gold star. Most of you aren't gonna know what it is. It's a, I will admit it's a harder to recognize plant to recognize just from looking at it. What I'm looking for is the white midrib here. Sometimes that's tinged with little pink. This is evening primrose. So this is a species that you do know, you would know it probably from the flower, which comes out during the second year. So this plant is a biennial. It has a two-year life cycle. So you want to harvest it between the first and second years, and that's when the root's going to like look like that. And you want to uh, 
the way I use this root is I use it like potatoes, like in potato pancakes. So I grate it up and uh, serve it that way. And it's quite good. So here's burdock. The burdock uh, edible part, uh, there's two main parts. There's the edible root. So this is a second year plant. This plant's also a biennial. So you wanna harvest the root between the first and second growing seasons. Burdock roots, though, you can't just grab this rosette and yank on it and pull out a root that way. It will break on you, so you have to dig them out, which is a lot of work. Um, uh, an herbalist was tell you, but that's where the most medicinal value is, and I would agree with that. But the easiest part to eat on a burdock is a developing second year flower stalk. So in the Boston area, these show up around the first or second weeks of June. So I just harvest that cut right there. And then I peel the outer layer off the burdock stalks and then cut them crosswise and boil them in salt and water until they're tender. And it's a delicious vegetable uh, just on its own or mixed into spaghetti sauce or uh, one way to use it is to uh, mix it with Parmesan cheese and breadcrumbs and mayonnaise and bake it in the oven and make this burdock flour stock bake. And that recipe for this is on my webpage. Black locust is considered an invasive species in Massachusetts, so it's another guilt-free opportunity. The one edible part on a black locust are these flowers, and they smell like jasmine and they taste like pea pods. So they're delicious straight from the tree and you can pick them off and eat them just like that. I love to make fritters from these, black locust fritters. This recipe is in my book. Daylilies are edible. The uh, shoots, the young shoots, which is what the stage of the plant in right now outside, the um, uh, daisy flower buds, so there's a flower bud right there. The open flowers and the wilted flowers and the tubers underneath the ground are all edible. And this plant has an oniony flavor. Now let me say two words of caution. You see, I've got caution here. One thing is I'm only speaking about the tall orange flowered daylilies, the one that you do see growing in the wild. Some of the other ones, I think some of the horticulturalists and the plant breeders are actually uh, gene splicing and mixing daylilies in their zeal to come up with new flowers. They might actually be mixing this plant with other species and, and then who knows about the edibility of the plant. So stick to the tall orange flowered species. So that's one caution. Second caution is, that uh, for a relatively small segment of the population, so it's less than 20%, it's a chemical in daylilies that may not agree with the digestive system. So if you eat a daylily, you might find that you feel nauseous and or you have a loose bowel movement afterwards. You'll get better right away. You won't have flashbacks or anything. You'll just know that daylilies don't agree with the digestive system. So this seems to be triggered most by eating the raw tubers, but it's possible that other parts of the plant would do it too. So this is a great plant for just trying a small amount for the first time, just to make sure you don't have an adverse effect from it. And then um, if you don't, uh, it's a yummy plant. Okay, purslane. So this is one that I hope all of you know, really common weed in organic farms. I'm sure in the summer, the, the farmers would love to have your help weeding this plant out of their beds. So this plant's edible raw, it's edible cooked. Um, it's high in omega-3 fatty acids and iron, so it's a healthy plant to eat too. This is also a plant that requires no cooking skill whatsoever because uh, one way to use it is gazpacho, and you don't even have to make the gazpacho. You could buy the gazpacho already made at the organic farm sand, and they just throw the purslane leaves into the gazpacho, and the texture of the purslane leaves works really well in a gazpacho. So if you haven't figured out already, we're well into the summer now, the heat of the summer for the wild edibles I'm talking about now. All right, so uh, in mid to late summer, you begin to see the sumacs out there. And now you might've been worried about sumac, uh, and the sumac you'd be worried about is poison sumac, which does not look like this, especially when the uh, berries are on the plant. That's what poison sumac berries look like. They look like poison ivy berries. So they're these drooping loose clusters of white or greenish white berries. So any sumac that has these tight upright red clusters of berries, it's not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So this one in the photo happens to be staghorn sumac, but also common in New England are the smooth sumac and the wing sumac, and you can use them the same way. So the major way you eat sumac is you actually drink sumac. You make a drink from the berries. And this next slide, uh, oh, so you pick the berry clusters off the plant and you just throw them in a bowl of water and rub them in the water and the water will eventually turn this pinker, pinkish, orange color from the flavor coming off the berries. So this is all explained in my book, but I'll just doing it here online in the show. And then you uh, fish the berries out, you're done with them. Do not put the berries in your compost pile unless you wanna be picking out sumac uh, seedlings out of your 
quote unquote finished compost for years and years afterwards. <laughs> I know this from bitter experience. So anyway, so do something else with the spent sumac berries and then fish out the berries and you have your liquid here, put it through any kind of a filter like a, a, a paper towel. And then the liquid that goes through, you can drink hot or cold, sweet or unsweet. And I typically make it cold and sweetened like lemonade. So here it is. And the entire time it takes from picking the fruit off the plant to drinking this drink can be as little as a half an hour. So there's your sumac aid. All right, so I mentioned acorns before. All oak trees produce acorns and all acorns are edible. The question is just how much tannic acid is in the acorns that you're harvesting and that will vary from species to species as well as from tree to tree. And generally speaking, the lower tannic acid you have starting with in your acorn, the less leaching that you have to do to make the acorns palatable. And I tend to gather acorns from the white oak group which tend to have lower levels of tannic acid just to uh, make sure that when I process the acorns, I have more flavor in the finished product that actually tastes like an acorn. Because when you use acorns from the red or black oak group, um, which a lot of people like to do, the leaching leaches out the acorn flavor too. So here's some fall harvest muffins. Uh, I can't remember if this recipe is on my webpage, but I'm happy to give it to you if it isn't. And that's made with acorn flour. Shagbar kickery, this is my number one favorite edible species of all the edible species that are out there. And here you see the shagginess of the bark. That's not a seasonal phenomenon. So the trees look like that all the time. So this time of year, although the nuts won't be in season until September, you have months to scope out locations to find shagbark hickory trees to harvest from. And I'll tell you right now that your best luck of finding nuts is not gonna be trees in the middle of the woods because um, uh, the squirrels and chipmunks will get most of them. You wanna look for trees that are out in the open, like on the edge of a road, on the edge of a field, in the middle of the field. And ideally you wanna find a place where there are many shagbark hickory trees growing together. And in places like that, even if the squirrels and chipmunks do harvest a lot of them, there'll still be a lot for you too. So there's the penny for scale. That's what the husk looks like on the outside of the nut. That's the inside of the nut. And so I am frequently filling up baskets with shagbark hickories when they're in season, which is from mid-September mid through mid-October with a high point being the first week of October. That's what the outside husk is. And this is in four parts. And the, this part often bursts off when the nuts fall off the trees onto the ground. This part bursts off and you're just seeing the shells on the ground. And then you crack those open to get the nut meat. And if you're really good, skilled, which I've developed over time, having done this quite a while, you could extract whole halves like this. And um, and uh, this is a really, really yummy plant. It's like a pecan, only even yummier. It's like, it's like a pecan that's been lightly sprayed with maple syrup. So as I say, my number one favorite edible. Here is a maple hickory nut pie. This recipe is in my book. Uh, and um, and it's really, I mean, it's like a Nor it's like a New England version of pecan pie. And most of the people I serve this to say, this is even better than pecan pie. So here's example of three different cookies I make from shagbark hickory nuts. And were this one of my typical live programs, I would have a batch of these cookies or something like this to serve you at the end of my talk. So I'm very sorry, I can't do that online. So anyway, all three are very yummy uh, ways to use shagbark hickory nuts. Okay, black walnuts. Uh, is a species that comes into season uh, as the shagbark hickories have been available for a couple weeks. So black walnuts are early October. This is what they look like on the tree. This is when they look like when they start to pile up on the ground. And so it is an admittedly messy task to get this part off, but um, the messiness of the, hu the husk and the fact that it smells a little bit means that where black walnuts grow, it's very likely that on whosever property they grow on, they'll be happy to have you take them. So uh, as I'm traveling around in October, when I see some black walnuts in somebody's yard, I'll go knock on the door and I'll say, I see you have some black walnuts, would you mind if I harvested some? And the typical response I get is, wait a minute, let me get my wheelbarrow and fill it up for you because people are eager to get these sort of messy, smelly nuts off their property. All right, so, uh, you need to get this outer green part off. And the way I usually do this, I stomp on this when I gather them, and get most of it off in the field, and I hose the rest off with the water from my rain barrel in my backyard patio. And then after you get that outer part off, they look like this. And then you dry them out for four to six weeks, which I also do with hickory nuts to make uh, the nut meat shrink a little bit so they shell out better. And yes, 
The other challenge with black walnuts is to get the shells open because they're really hard. So you can use a rock, you can use a hammer, you can use a vise, which is uh, probably many of you have those in your garage or tool room and, and, and that'd be good. Here's a device I use. I actually got this from a company in Oklahoma, which I'm afraid is not in business anymore. And, uh, and this device enables me to extract large pieces on black walnuts. And here's two um, recipes I love to make with black walnuts, the baklava on the left, uh, and then the black walnut honey squares. And I think this recipe is on my webpage in the recipe section. And if it isn't, I'm happy to share with you. I frequently make these in my programs. They're very popular people. They're very easy to make. It only takes about an hour. All right, Jerusalem artichoke. This one is a fall and spring edible season opportunity. So this one is still available now in Eastern Massachusetts. You just need to know where the plants are uh, to find them. So in a normal season, you'd look for them or notice them when they're blooming in September, they look like this. And then you'd go to that spot where you'd see dried stalks and you dig underneath those dried stalks a few inches below the ground and you encounter the tubers. So those tubers are there right now in about two or three weeks, the tuber will begin to sprout and get used up by the developing new plants. So they'll be out of season then. So, but you can still get them now. And you see how they come in sort of a, a beige outer part or mauve outer part. And either way they're edible. And you can use those most ways to use potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. All right, so here is autumn olive. This is another one of my favorite edible wild plants, another invasive species, another total guilt-free foraging opportunity. And this is uh, an exceedingly common plant in our landscape, uh, largely because actually in the 50s, it was believed that this was a good plant to plant for birds and other wildlife because it fruits prolifically and, and uh, people thought, well, this is good bird food. And actually uh, it's turned out not to be so good for the birds because this plant does not support native insects. So there's no like native butterfly caterpillars on it. So it's actually not feeding the birds at a critical time in the spring now when birds need to feed caterpillars to their young nestlings in the nest. So uh, autumn olive is not held in any high regard by ecologists, but my attitude about invasive species is that if the ecologists eradicate them, so be it. In the meantime, if they're edible, I'm going to eat them and I'm going to teach other people how to eat them too. So in the spring, in May, when they bloom, is a good time to spot them in the landscape because they're covered with these nice, nice smelling flowers. So there's a close of what the flowers look like. The smell is identical to a native but non-edible species called sweet pepper bush that blooms in the summer. <clears throat> this is what the berries look like. And this is very typical for autumn olive is they fruit so prolifically that the picking is really easy. So what I'll do is just take my basket or my bucket and park it underneath a branch. And with one hand, I pull down the branch. With the other hand, I just go tickle, tickle, tickle. And that's uh, when you know when the fruit is ripe, because if it's falling into the basket or the bucket with just a tickle, you know that it's ripe. And if it doesn't come off, then it's not ripe yet. So this plant's called autumn olive because the fruit is ripe in the fall. In October is the best time to look for it. And there's a close-up of the berry. You see that they have silvery white speckles on the outside. And Although all autumn olive berries are edible, they vary considerably in flavor from bush to bush. So sometimes they're puckery and astringent and not very good at all. And other times they could be quite sweet and the flavor is quite similar to a Thompson green seedless grape. These fruits have seeds in them, which you could swallow or spit out. It doesn't really matter. And I found in, from my experience that the larger and rounder and redder the seed, the more likely it is to be yummy. So uh, look for that. And here's a couple products that you can make from, from autumn olive. So this autumn olive wine was made from berries that I picked and gave to the vintner. And he gave me a case of wine uh, as a, a thank you gift, which was great. And it actually, I thought, came out quite good. And this fruit leather is very easy to make. It's described in my book. And all you do is just um, gather the fruit and you make a puree from it and you pour that puree into trays in a food dehydrator. And if you don't have one of those, I know of people that have made it just by pouring them into cookie trays in their oven or even in a wood stove. You could do it that way. But I have a food dehydrator, the kind that you plug into the wall and you just pour that puree in there and you let it run overnight. And the next day you've got this wonderful fruit leather. And if I'm lucky, I can make it without having to add any sugar at all. Sometimes when the fruit is little on the tart side, I'll add a couple tablespoons of sugar, but still most of the sweetness is coming from the autumn olive itself, 
And this fruit loaf is really tasty. I serve it at most of my live programs. So once again, sorry, I can't give you any all over this webinar. And um, and the flavor is really yummy. And it's also, uh, besides tasting good, it has vitamin C in it. And the USDA did a study of the autumn olive fruit pulp a few years ago, and they found out that that fruit pulp is up to 18 times higher in lycopene content than tomatoes. So I'm hearing more and more good things about lycopene uh, for uh, human health. So that'd be a really fun way to take your lycopene is to eat autumn olive fruit leather. So I wanted to leave lots of time for questions at the end. So that's my last show, uh, my last slide in the show. And I just want to uh, uh, mention this book that I kept talking about in the show. So ordinarily in a live show, I'd have a box of my books in the back of the room and I could just sell you one there. But since I can't do that over the internet, you can get one from the publisher, which is the Essex County Greenbelt Association. And I put the info down in the lower left corner there. So just uh, write that down and do that to get a copy of this book. The books, um, they cost 15 bucks or something like that. There might be a little you know, cost for mailing to you, whatever. Uh, but when I sell these books, I give all the money to Greenbelt because Greenbelt actually allows foraging as a permitted activity on all their properties that are open to the public. And I'm so grateful for that. I just said, keep all the money and buy more land with it. So anyway, and there's a link to where to find me on the internet. And if you click on that link, you're gonna see a sorry tale of all these programs that I had agreed to do, these live programs that have been postponed or canceled. So uh, this is the first and only webinar that I've done so far this season. I've got a couple more in the queue and when those are organized and if they're open to the public, I will absolutely post info about them on this same link. And, um, and there's my email, feel free to write me with any questions you have. And with that, I'll end the show and turn it back over to Anna for answering questions. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much, Russ. What a wonderful walk, virtual walk that we took with you through a wonderful edible landscape. Uh, we have some wonderful questions that are coming over and I wanted to introduce Doug Cook. He is our education events coordinator. He's working uh, the scenes tonight, gathering the questions as they're coming in. So um, Doug, I don't know if you wanna take yourself off of mute real quick and uh, give everyone the greetings and then we will get to these questions. I know I'm putting you on the spot right now. If not, uh, Doug's given me some, some great questions. Um, first, there was a question about Shasta daisies and you talked about daisies earlier. Are these edible? Oh, I actually don't know. So uh, the species I was talking about is what I call the oxide daisy. So this is the she loves me, she loves me not daisy. This is the one that I see wild growing in the landscape in old fields and uh, edge of school ball fields, stuff like that. Shasta daisy, as far as I know, doesn't occur in the wild, at least not in this region. So, um, so uh, I really don't know anything about it. Uh, but um, yeah, look for the wild one. That one I can say is uh, yummy. All right. All right. Very good. Um, going on to burdock, um, and you talked about the uh, when to actually, in, in its season, when to actually harvest that. Uh, someone had a question. How do you tell the difference between the first and second year of a, of a plant, particularly a plant like burdock? Oh, okay. So, um it's not, I, I don't have a very scientific answer to that. I will just tell you from basic common sense. So this time of year, uh, if you see a little burdock plant, it's going to be a second year plant that's just beginning to leaf out. So that would be an excellent time if you have the patience to dig up a root to do it. Uh, the uh, In June, if you see some little burdock plants with leaves that are like two or three inches in diameter, those will be first year plants that are just getting started from seed that season. And uh, in the fall, if you're thinking about, uh, okay, what is a first year burdock plant I could harvest a root from in the fall? It's any plant that's got large green leaves you can harvest because the burdock plants that are second year plants will have already gone to seed and died by the time uh, the uh, fall comes. Okay, very good. Uh, in your conversation about sumac, um, and you showed us those beautiful uh, pictures with the berries, um, have you heard of anyone um, or any um, allergies coming from the sumac tree? 
tree. Okay, so sumac is in the Anacardiaceae family, uh, which also has uh, uh, poison ivy and um, and poison sumac, uh, and it also has mango uh, in that family. And I have heard of people having an ultra high idiosyncratic sensitivity to plants in the uh, in that uh, botanical family, like they can get uh, a rash from handling uh, mangoes, for example. So yes, uh, that can occasionally happen. But for most people, uh, the sumac is safely edible. And if you're one of those that just has the idiosyncratic adverse reaction, then you just have to stay away from sumac. But it, it's not common to have people have an adverse reaction to the safely edible sumacs I talked about in this show. Okay, very good. Um, this was a specialty question about a plant called, and I may be mispronouncing it, Portul Portulaca. Yes. Uh, the one that you can get in a garden center. Is yes. that also edible? I don't think so. Uh, okay. It sure would be fun if it was. <laughs> and we used to grow that in front of our house. And, uh, and so I researched it and I could not find anything online that would back up the fact that it's edible. So unfortunately, I, I can't say that it is. So we'll just have to stick to the, the purslane weed, which is okay. also in the genus Pork Jalaka, which, is, which prompted that question. Okay. And speaking of purslane, there was a question that just came through. Uh, thoughts on drying personally, does it hurt the benefit if you dry it? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't think so. I don't know for sure, but I, I wouldn't think so because the constituents, the iron and the omega-3 fatty acids, I, uh, I don't think they would uh, evaporate. I think they would be largely retained in the plant tissues even if you dry the plant. Okay. Now, we're uh, looking at a few questions here as it relates to um, volume. So uh, a question came in, which wild edibles do you find to be maxim, max, um, to get the most flavor content from for your effort? So the most flavorful, the most um, with little to no effort, what are some of those plants that uh, you get the most flavor from? Oh, uh, that's interesting. Well, um, that, that's uh, kind of a hard question to answer because, you know, for example, um, some of the wild mints, for example, uh, can have very strong flavors. And so you can use just a little bit will make a delicious tea without having to use very much of the plant at all. Um, and um, and uh, there, there's uh, um, uh, some plants that I wasn't able to get to in the show today that have some uh, strong flavors out there. Uh, for example, uh, bayberry, a native species that where you can use the leaves like bay leaves that is a strong flavor. You only have to use just a little bit of that to convey the effect. So uh, there are some uh, strong flavored plants out there that are uh, very uh, yummy. Like uh, another plant I didn't get to is wild strawberry. Uh, you know, wild, wild strawberry, what it lacks in size, it makes up for in the intensity of its flavor. Yes, the fruits are little, but boy, are they delectable. So, and that's uh, a fairly common thing with, with uh, the wild counterparts of conventional species um, that uh, the flavor is often more concentrated. Okay, very good. Um, a question about location for uh, picking or going out foraging in the Boston area. Do you know of any parks or places around the Boston area that are good options for foraging? Well, um, uh, not that where where there's an express welcome mat that's rolled out saying, hey, everybody, come forage here. Uh, so um, I, I wish I could, you know, unequivocally point you to a spot and say, it's okay to do it there. You know, I do occasionally run into people that are foraging in the city. And it's often, interestingly enough, uh, immigrants, people that grew up somewhere else and did the foraging tradition where they came from and then some of the plants that they're picking here are plants they knew from where they came from and they are continuing to pick them here. So, um, so the, the best thing to do in reality is um, look for these plants in your backyard or anywhere else where you can identify the owner and you can contact the owner and the manager of the property and just ask them. And it might be that they're fine with it, especially if you're interested in picking weeds from somebody's backyard or a place like that 
Uh, and the nice thing about actually getting permission from somebody is you can really relax about the picking. You don't have to be looking over your shoulder saying, is anybody going to care that I'm doing this? Okay, very good. Uh, with juniper berries, I know this was not a variety that you mentioned, but there was a question, are all varieties of juniper berries in Massachusetts edible? Yeah, so as far as I know, they are, but uh, but that's an example of a plant that I encourage people to use very sparingly because it can actually cause kidney damage if you consume too much of it. So go easy on the juniper and consider that one as a little goes a long way in terms of using it just uh, uh, sparingly as a spice uh, and just leaving it at that. Okay. Uh Concerning black walnuts, you showed us that wonderful picture of harvested black walnuts. How long will they keep in their hard shell? Oh, great question. Okay, so I've got black walnuts in my basement. After you shell, after you um, take that husk off and you dry them, you can store black walnuts, shagbark hickory nuts, hazelnuts, and any nut like that for at least a year. Uh, with that, as long as they're still in the shell, without them going bad, as long as they're kept in a relatively cool and dry place. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'm happily eating black walnuts I gathered last fall that are still on the shell and I just shell them as I uh, use them. Same thing for hazelnuts and shagbark hickory nuts. And now after you shell them, it, it is good to refrigerate or freeze the nut meats uh, to prevent them from going rancid. But no, they'll keep in the shell for at least a year. Okay, very good. And with autumn olives, how do you how do you initially process the autumn olives? Oh, so uh, so yes, you you can eat autumn olives raw directly off the plant. I think I mentioned that in the talk. Uh, and so to puree them, what I do is you know as I said, the picking is fast, so I'll bring a big bucket or basket of autumn olives home, and I'll get out a big pot like a lobster pot, and I'll put just enough water in the bottom to prevent the fruit from scorching, like a half an inch of water. I dump all that fruit in there and I simmer it for a while, like about 20, 25 minutes at just the very, very lowest of a simmer. And then um, I put everything through a food mill, which a lot of people have. It's just a, a device with a, a strainer and a crank and you crank it and it pushes all the pulp through and the seeds are held back. But if you don't have one of those, you can just use a strainer or a sieve and that will hold the seeds back. And then what goes through the um, uh, the food mill or the strainer, it's a uh, uh, mauve colored puree, uh, which that's the raw material, that's the puree that uh, I used to make the fruit leather, but um, but even at that stage, even if you don't dehydrate it, you can just use that as the raw material for making these delicious autumn olive sorbet, autumn olive chiffon pie, autumn olive uh, uh, jams and jellies, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, plantains. Uh, someone's asking, are you a fan of those, and can and where can you find them in Massachusetts? So, well, uh, there's several different kinds of plantain that are edible. Uh, the one that I would recommend is the common plantain, Plantago major, which has the broad leaf that's shaped like a human footprint, which is actually where the word plantain comes from. It has the same etymological root as plantar warts, plantar fasciitis. It basically means foot or foot shaped in Latin. And that's why the Native Americans called this non-native species white man's footprint because the only place they ever encountered the plant is where the explorers, the colonists have been in and tracked the seeds in from Europe. So anyway, when those leaves are small, so this time of year in the spring, they're edible raw, they're edible cooked. You can make like a pureed soup from them, like a split peat soup from them. Later on in the summer, they get kind of tough and herby, but in the spring, uh, they're quite palatable. Okay. Now here's a question concerning elderberry. Uh, there's a person interested in growing elderberry on their property, and they want to know if there are varieties of Sambucus canadensis that are better tasting than others. Uh, there is some variation in the flavor of the fruit and the size of the fruit. This is one species that is available as a straight species, and there are also several cultivars out there that are just basically uh, the common elderberry, St. Pucus canadensis, but just a variety that somebody uh, found with unusually large fruit or unusually tasty fruit. So the York elderberry is an example of a cultivar that a lot of places like Fedco will carry, or that Fedco has something called Good Barn elderberry, which has an unusually large uh, 
uh, flower head and seed head with large uh, amounts of large fruits. Uh, so yes, um, uh, but even just your straight species elderberry, your wide elderberry that you find, encounter in the wild has delicious fruit. Uh, it is on the aromatic side, so you do have to add sugar. And I often like to pair it with apples. So elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is much uh, more interesting than just plain applesauce or apple pie. Okay, very good. Um, this is concerning cucumbers. I know, um, I don't think you spoke about this in your presentation, but someone has um, the wild cucumbers and they'd like to know, are they edible? I wish they were. I know that species, Echin Echinocystis lobata, I think is the botanical name, and it's called the wild of the squirting cucumber. It's a native uh, plant in the cucumber family, and it's a vine, and it clambers over things, and it has a very spiny uh, outer husk with enormous seeds that are very pretty, and I really want those seeds to be edible, but I have not found any um, corroboration anywhere that says they're edible, and I'm afraid they're not unfortunately. Okay. Uh, any recommendations for books for keying out species around here or in general? So are there any other books out there? on? Forestry? Yeah, uh, there are some good books. Um, and um, probably the best book to help you on learning plants is just your standard field guides uh, like Newcomb's or uh, Gleason and Cronquist, things like that. Uh, that won't specialize in edibles, but are, you know, the field guides that, that give distinguishing characteristics and stuff like that uh, in the book. And then you pair that with a book like my book or another wild edibles book to say, okay, now I finally know what this is from my general field guide. Now I find out how to eat it and what the recipes are and what the edible part is and when to harvest it from this wild food guide. Okay. Uh, this is a question concerning fiddleheads, and this is uh, sounds like from a new forager. They'd like to know, um, I would love to find some, but try, haven't been able to see them anywhere that I have looked. Any tips? <laughs> well, uh, now, some of you on this webinar are from regions where the ostrich fern, which is the main species of edible fern, are easily found. But for most of us in Eastern Mass, I would say one of the biggest mistake that novice foragers make in Eastern Mass is they'll go walking in the woods in the spring and they'll see a bunch of ferns at the curl up young stage when almost all ferns go through that fiddlehead stage and they'll say, oh, fiddleheads, boy, that looks an awful lot like what I've seen for sale in the stores. And so they pick it and they bring it home and they cook it up and they eat it and it tastes horrible. And they say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvested the wrong species of fern. So I only know of two species of fern that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity. And that one is the ostrich fern. That is the quote unquote fiddlehead fern, the species that you see available in the stores. And, um, and if you go to my webpage and you go to the articles section of my webpage, you'll see an article there from Yankee Magazine. And in that article, there is a panel which describes the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. And so that's what I encourage anybody interested in foraging for fiddleheads to look for. Okay. And there is a question concerning your work propagating native edible plants, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so sure. So since I retired from my day job in 2015, I'm playing the role of Johnny Appleseed for native edible species. And I've set up a nursery outside of Boston where I'm propagating over a thousand plants, most of which I gathered from seed that uh, I grew from seed that I gathered myself. And then I'm working on arrangements with land trusts, organic farms, state and federal agencies, cities and towns, schools and colleges, tribal groups and others to plant plants in my nursery in appropriate places in their properties. And I've done about two dozen projects so far. So this is my way of expressing gratitude to nature for all the yummy things I've been nibbling on all these years. It's my way that I, I, I feel I can give back. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about barberry and its uses? Okay, so there's two major species of barberry that we run into here in the Northeast. There's the Japanese barberry and the European barberry. And uh, they both have berberine in them. And berberine, uh, you see when you yank up the roots of these plants and they're very yellow. And uh, berberine is, uh, 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 it's an alkaloid. And I don't know uh, a lot about it chemically, but I do know it's held in high regard. Uh, it's the same thing that's in golden seal. And so um, 
uh, it has a lot, it's considered a very medicinally useful plant. Now, edibility wise, the Japanese barberry berries just don't taste good. They're not poisonous, but they're, they're way too bitter. But the, the common uh, European barberry, which is actually less common than Japanese barberry, is edible. There's a whole chapter in my book about it. And the berries are very tart like cranberries, but they make what I consider to be the best jelly there is. Really, really good. And, uh, and those berries are a late season foraging opportunity. So we're talking about November and sometimes they persist on the bushes in the winter. So you can even, if you've got a case of cabin fever in the middle of the winter, you can go out and still pick barberries. Okay. Now this is concerning hosta shoots. How do you serve hosta shoots? And do you eat other parts of it as well? Oh, I'm embarrassed to say I've never eaten a hosta shoot, and I even have them in my backyard. Oh, it's shame on me. I, I do know they're edible. I know that in Japan, uh, it is a frequent way that people interact with this plant by eating it. And uh, and there are certainly people around uh, in the Northeast that, that do know from personal experience how to eat hosta shoots. But... Uh, from what I understand, once again, I've never done it myself, but from what I understand, uh, it's the young shoots when they're like a few inches tall, that's the right stage to eat the plant and that you want to steam them, cook them and eat them. And I don't believe any other part of the hosta plant is as good as that part of the plant. Okay. As we wind down to our last few questions, um, how long should we dry shag bark hickory nuts? Okay. so. Um, so I gather a whole bunch of those, as I indicated, since it's my number one favorite. And for the ones that I actually want to grow trees from, you know, propagate new trees from, you can't let those nuts dry out. If they dry out, they lose their viability. So for any nut, and this is true with black, nuts, black walnuts, hazelnuts, any nut you want to try and grow a tree from, don't let it dry out. Store it in a plastic bag in the fridge until you sow it. Now for the shagbark hickories you want to eat, you can uh, crack one open and eat it right on the spot instantly as soon as you find it. And it's delicious. The problem is the nut meat is so moist at that stage that it doesn't separate from the shell well. So what I will do is let the nut season for at least a month, ideally two months before I start shelling them. And what happens at that stage is the nut inside the shell will dry out and lose its viability so it actually dies. It can't grow into a tree, but it shrinks a little bit from the shell. So when you crack the hickory shell open, that's how you're able to extract big pieces out. Mm -hmm. And this is our, our last question for the night and a great one to end on. It's from a brand new forager. Haven't done this before. What What's the next best step after this webinar? <laughs> well, uh, if you feel like you confidently know and recognize some of the plants that uh, I pointed out are edible in this talk, like dandelions, for example, things that are in season right now, that would be my first step is just go out to my backyard and look for a dandelion. And um, and they are the entire plant is perfectly edible straight into your mouth. Wash it off with you know water from your rain barrel, whatever, and then you could pop the entire thing in your mouth. And um, and once again, you know, there will be some bitterness to it, which uh, especially after I was reminded recently by herbalists that bitter is good for you, I said, bring it on. You know, I'm going to eat this plant and bitterness, I don't care. It's really good for me and it's yummy. Uh, but uh, you can also, as I said, uh, boil the buds for 60 seconds and it's really a delicious wild vegetable. All right. Wow, thank you to everyone that gave such wonderful questions. And Russ, thank you for taking us on such a wonderful walk through the edibles that surround us. We are so grateful for your time. Um, if folks have additional questions after this webinar, they can reach you at eatwild at rcn.com, the, uh, the email that you have listed here or your website That's right. here. That's okay. right. Okay, please, please do. And I do know um, he's put where you can get the book. Um, hopefully, does the publisher still have books available to your knowledge? Yeah, they do. They do. Okay. <laughs> they, uh, unsurprisingly, they have told me that they've seen an uptake in interest in foraging lately. So, uh, but they, okay. they're they're well supplied. So, yes, uh, if you want one, you you should be able to get one. Okay, very good. And you will let us know of your upcoming webinars. Um, 
that are talking more about foraging and yes, uh, so they'll, yeah, they'll show up on that URL that I have on this uh, on the end screen here, the scheed.htm when okay. when they're arranged. Perfect, perfect. Thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your schedules to be with us. Thank you to Russ for taking time out of his schedule to give us such a wonderful presentation and walk uh, through wild edibles that are right in our backyard, right near us. Uh, next week, we will be talking about getting started with backyard chickens. So if you're brand new to backyard chickens, please join.